Hello everyone, I'm Danny Roddy of DannyRoddy.com, and today I'm talking with Jay Dyer of Jay'sAnalysis.com, an author of Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2. Today Jay and I will discuss the CIA as organized crime, the popularity of anti-conspiracy culture, and the problems with grounding a worldview in atheist materialism. In addition to thanking Jay for talking with me today, I'd like to thank my patrons for making this show and all the content I produce possible. If you would like to become a patron, please go to patreon.com slash Roddy. As always, please do your own research and come to your own conclusions. And in the spirit of William Blake, the true method of knowledge is experiment. Without further ado, here is the show. Just your thoughts on anti-conspiracy culture. That word is just in the vernacular and it's used so liberally against people that go outside of the mainstream. And, and even if there are things like MK Ultra or Gladio or Paperclip or a Phoenix program or Mockingbird, mm-hmm. Mockingbird or Northwoods, people are completely oblivious to these things. And they tend to think of the CIA as a social service organization or something like that. So it's just, there's a strong resistance to it. And I'm curious on your thoughts of how that resistance was like constructed. Well, uh, really conspiracy if you want to call it that, it's just another way to speak about the world of geopolitics and espionage and the darker aspects of human social interactions. So if we understand the term to mean that, then obviously conspiracy exists. Governments conspire, corporations conspire, individuals conspire, cartels conspire. Uh, it's really kind of inane and and uh, lowbrow <laughs> to, to not believe that conspiracies exist in the world. It's just really a, coming from a place of extreme ignorance. But we know as well that uh, during the JFK uh, hearings that the CIA weaponized the term to be something of a pejorative a way to easily, through false association, basically discount anybody who challenges any kind of official narrative. But uh, if you've studied things like PR, if you've studied things like the history of the Inquisition, uh, if you've studied the history of the way propaganda works, then you know that that elites have always operated to control narratives. This wasn't something that began with Mockingbird or or anything like that. It's, It's always existed. And you can go back to Renaissance, medieval ancient world doesn't matter whether you're talking about Machiavelli in his book, Art of War. Uh, He talks a lot about the ways to use psychological warfare, psyops, et cetera, in warfare to basically control people's thoughts, control their mind. In in other words, the way that they should accept the narratives of why the battle is being fought, this kind of stuff. So that kind of gives rise to everybody's familiar with the prince, I'm sure, too. It gives rise to modern psychological warfare, modern propaganda, modern narrative construction, I guess. And that goes, again, back to the ancient world. The, the elites that ran the ancient empires, they knew this stuff, too. Maybe not as scientifically sophisticated as we do in the modern world after World War One and World War Two and the Cold War, but they had the basics of this down. And so the a lot of the secret societies of the ancient world just from a practical standpoint, the mysteries, I mean, they certainly had a religious element to them, but a lot of those mysteries had to do with initiating people into the ways of ruling man. And that's essentially what those societies' functions do was to rule and govern and control mankind. If we fast forward to today, the simple answer to your question is, what is the CIA? Well, the CIA is just the private army of the bankers. That's, I think it was uh, Servando Gonzalez in his book, Psychological Warfare in the New World Order, which is not a conspiracy text. He's a, a, a uh, intelligence analyst. And I think he coined that that uh, phrase accurately as a way to describe what the CIA is. It's, it's not a, a means of protecting and saving the free world. Uh, it's not an organization dedicated to these uh, lofty, high-sounding goals. A lot of people who are recruited into it may believe that. And on the basis of, of patriotism, they're manipulated into thinking this. The same with other countries, too. I'm not just saying that's, that's the CIA, but uh, you know, most of the modern governments in the world today are atheistic. So you're essentially just serving some private corporate interest uh, that you don't know about. And it's no different from the origins of the OSS and the CIA. They come out of the essentially the Rockefeller family and their power and influence uh, and other uh, big bloodline families, big banking families, and a lot of British elites. That's actually who set up uh, the CIA was British intelligence uh, working with uh, Bill Donovan and others in the U.S. to to establish an intelligence agency. But again, that had predecessors as well back to 
World War World War One and previously uh, intelligence, which kind of makes the most sense, would be conducted by the military. But what you have with the OSS and the CIA is the conducting of intelligence by private networks set up by really wealthy families. So that model is what dominates the world today. And when you understand that, you can understand how it's uh, pretty much a centralized control structure. So there are thousands of people that work for the CIA, but many of them are compartmentalized. They don't know the bigger picture. Because if you listen to my Quigley talks, I think it was the case that that book was essentially given to CIA handlers. So people who were, were out in the field who were somewhat veteran to tradecraft knew about what was really going on. And perhaps a lot of the people they were handling, they didn't know geopolitics. They didn't know the big picture. They didn't know that there was a, a plan on behalf of the Atlantis' power block to you know, establish a world government, this kind of stuff. All they knew was uh, what they were fighting in terms of the Cold War or World War II or whatever. So dialectics is a big part of it. But uh, the CIA is a, is a machine to create culture. It's a machine to control narratives in the media. It's a machine to um, stage coups in other countries. Uh, they are essentially, again, the busy bees of the bankers. You kind of answered it, but just to get it out of the way, the most common uh, retort to any any kind of um, thought on so-called conspiracy is like, oh, well, that would take too many people to keep their mouths shut. So just to reiterate, you're, you're talking about compartmentalization, just not everybody knowing what exactly is going on. Like I think the Manhattan Project had like what, like 130,000 people or something work on it? Uh, no, it was a few thousand people on the Manhattan Project, and the, the information was completely compartmentalized. And so, yeah, I mean, that's always been a classic example of something that they were able to keep secret for a long time. Uh, now, eventually, of course, you know, the, the knowledge got out, but uh, for, for many years, people didn't know about it. And even the thousands of people working there didn't know the whole picture. So, uh, you know, compartmentalization of knowledge is something that's classic. It's, it's classic to governments. It's classic to secret societies. And it's classic to intelligence agencies and the military. That's how the whole thing functions. Something you mentioned that I really liked that you said that the culture was trying to separate people from their instincts. And part of this was relying on expert culture. So just kind of handing the person's own autonomy off to a so-called expert, whether it be a scientist, a doctor, a school teacher. Yeah, the idea of the technocratic state, uh, I've covered this in a lot of talks. I, I do a series of talks on books written by the globalists called The Globalist Book Series, uh, aptly named. And I cover everybody from Brzezinski to H.G. Wells to Bertrand Russell to Arthur Kessler to uh, modern guys like Jacques Attali. So yeah, there was a chapter, the middle chapter in Quigley's book, Tragedy and Hope, is about the rise of the managerial society. And he says that the government of the future will be uh, under the so-called scientific expert. So that is the essence of technocracy, is, is rule by uh, scientific expertise, supposedly, a managerial society. And so a big part of that, yes, is the uh, engineering and shifting of man in terms of his self-perception. Who does man see man as, uh, right? Changing images of man and so forth, shifting it away from the ideas of self-sufficiency and that kind of stuff. Surely, you know, there's no doubt about that towards uh, an unbalanced notion of the collective. And uh, if you think about somebody like Huxley, Huxley is very clear about this in his uh, perennial philosophy that the, the worldview in terms of globalism for the future, in terms of religion, will be perennialism. It'll be basically a, a melding and blending of all the religions into one. So there'll be a collectivization in the religious sphere that will mirror the collectivization in the social governmental sphere that will mirror the collectivization in the economic sphere. So that's pretty clearly the basis for the, the, the coming global government. And what you describe there uh, is, in essence, technocracy ruled by managers. The false dialectics, shifting people to like these two sides and then a WWE of having them compete against each other. And the oligarchy transcends the political sandbox. And right. so I'm sure you've talked about it to death. I apologize. But the intellectual no, okay. dark web, them being this cream of the crop of intellectuals. Sure. This is an old trick to, uh, you know, so-called intellectuals have been propped up for a long time. Ten years ago, it was the new atheists, right? It was uh, Bill Nye and, and Neil deGrasse Tyson and, and other clowns, like Richard Dawkins, who are propped up as the, the so-called experts, so-called scientific elite. Uh, now that's kind of evolved into a new crop, like you said, the uh, intellectual so-called dark web, uh, who are, yeah, just the, the phony anti-establishment people. Uh, JBP. At JBP. <laughs> and uh, Carl Jung, I don't know if you've heard of him, but uh, I, I, have a master of, I have a master's degree in Carl Jung and repeating everything he said as if I was a genius. Yeah, I mean... 
if you've read Carl Jung, and, I, and I've, I've read Carl Jung, and I think he's interesting, he's insightful. I don't totally discount reading Carl Jung and archetypes, but he's also can be very dangerous, and you have to kind of guard yourself because it, it can really turn into, a, in my view, a weird Gnostic type of thing. So, but yeah, the idea of propping up so called scientists, that actually goes back uh, like 100 years. They were doing that with, I, I heard some interesting arguments about people who were propped up 100 years ago. Uh, and I have to give Alan Watt credit for that because he called my attention to that. And it makes perfect sense again with propaganda. So, you know, one of the things that the CIA and the OSS and these different groups have studied is culture. And as I said earlier, culture creation, that's a big part of how the system works because you don't influence people primarily through the news. You do a certain segment of the population, but you influence a lot more people through music and movies, you know, pop culture. So that's crucial to the system. That's a big part of, you know, my two books, Esoteric Hollywood 1 and 2. And I think when we look at it from that vantage point, and we can again begin to see how unified the program is. So you asked about dialectics. Yeah, I mean, politics quickly says for 100 years has been essentially been a, a dialectical game played by people who are much higher up than the uh, governmental class. The governmental class is elected by the people to serve the elite. <laughs> and then they, they learn that as they learn the system. I mean, in, a, in one way, it's in one sense, it's simple, but in another sense, it's complex. Because the scams that are run, you know, like the big monetary banking scams, shadow banking, all that kind of stuff is very complex. So the average Joe doesn't get it. The average politician doesn't get it. But the people at the top get it. And they make it very clear to the people who come into the world of politics that, you know, you don't serve the people, you serve us. Uh, and that should be pretty common sense, right? I mean, who do you think has more power in America? You know, David Rockefeller and his family with, you know, billions of dollars and who knows how much in assets or, you know, somebody like Nancy Pelosi. You know, I mean, Nancy Pelosi has a lot of money, but, <laughs> you know, I mean, if you watch those old clips of Bill Clinton when he was elected, who does he think? I'd like to thank Dave Rockefeller for, for helping my campaign and putting me here. You know, I mean, he goes to the, the trilateral CFR meetings and, and he thanks Dave Rockefeller. Speaking of, I saw that you posted a photo of Jordan Peterson at the trilateral commission, which I thought was extremely revealing. Uh, but something I wanted to touch on was that I think when you talk about oligarchy uh, or the genocidal oligarchy, people try to relate that to experiences they've had with authority figures, uh, and, and they don't see it as being plausible that uh, people could be that bad or people could have a headspace of that's so demented. Uh, I don't know. What do you think about that? It is a different mindset, and I mean, we see this if, even if you're familiar with. Uh the British class system, for example, the class system in Britain was based around a rigid uh, caste that if you if you're familiar with the Hindu caste system, you can see why the British had such an interest and a fascination for, you know, India, right, one of, which is one of their uh, colonized states. You know, India's caste system makes perfect sense with this sort of Luciferian social Darwinism view of the British oligarchy. I mean, it's not an accident that the British elite gave us Darwinism. Darwinism isn't just a so-called scientific philosophy. It's an actual worldview, a grand narrative, mystical worldview about the elite, basically. And of course, the, you know, the British upper class, upper caste has seen fit to deem themselves the top of this monkey pyramid and it, that in their mind through social darwinism gives the them the right to rule and to essentially put into effect the you know, extreme dysgenics views that they have and to basically do whatever it takes to ensure that the masses of people are either dead sterilized or uh, you know turned into slugs and, and zombies and, and social justice zombies, maniacs, basically. And so the irony, I guess, about somebody like Jordan Peterson would be that the classical liberal worldview that he that he espouses is essentially 100 percent synonymous with the actual philosophy of the ruling elite, which is social Darwinism. And if you paid attention to like Box Day's critiques of Jordan Peterson, he's caught on to that. He's pointed out how Peterson's Modus operandi is essentially use people to get to the top. And that's that's what other people are there for, is for you to get to the top. Because it's just a it's a lobster totem pole of climbing <laughs> to the top of a pile of lobsters or something. I don't know what, what his whole lobster thing is, but I think he just tried to pick some some creature to be his like marketing gimmick, like a little mascot, like a <laughs> I'm 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 Jordan the lobster. 
I'm the mascot for JBP. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's I think one of the unique aspects about what I do and my approach is that I go after Darwinism. I don't believe Darwinism. I'm very critical of evolutionary theory. That's not to say that there's not uh, adaptation of species. There are. But the uh, classical Darwinian and the neo-Darwinian approaches uh, go far beyond claims of life science. They actually verge over very clearly into the realms of uh, religion and metaphysics and grand narrative claims. And when you start making grand narrative claims, you're no longer in the sphere of empirical science. You're in the sphere of uh, holistic narratives and religion for mankind. So that's why the, the approach I have is very different from Jordan Peterson. It's very different from uh, you know a lot of the people in the alt media. A lot of people in alternative media will never ever question Darwinism, and we do a Jay's analysis, and I think that's a big part because uh, as I read through the globalist books, and I think we've gone through about 15, 16, 17 or so of them now. There are a few unifying factors amongst all the globalists for the last uh, hundred years, and one of those is Darwinism. You have to believe Darwinism; it's a dogma. You know, others would be things like uh, depopulation, technocratic control. A unified you know, world currency, this kind of stuff, uh, breaking down of uh, borders and nation states. Those are all aspects of, of the uh, global system that all of the global elite have, have had in common for the last 100 years. And one of those is Darwinism. And it's kind of amazing to me how few people who claim to, uh, you know, be against the new world order, against globalism or whatever, they don't, they don't talk about this. They don't ever question Darwinism because uh, I think, I guess everybody thinks it's just kind of a given, but it's not. And when you really start delving into evolutionary theory and its claims, you realize, well, this is just repackaged from ancient Hinduism. And it's not really that big of a breakthrough and it has all these problems. And it's pretty goofy <laughs> if you start thinking about it. Because, for example, if you if you start looking at how bodily systems within any organism or any complex organism, I should say, uh, all of those systems are, are, are holistic, for example. And this is a very powerful critique that uh, David Berlinski has made. And he points out that, like, you can't have have the evolution of one, say, uh, a gill or an eye or something like this without the holistic functioning of the other systems, right? So in other words, like an eye that requires tissue, that requires blood, it requires blood requires a heart. So one of the errors of the classical Darwinists was to think that that these things just kind of start emerging, you know, from, from the being, from the uh, species, you know, on its own or whatever. But that really doesn't that doesn't work with the way we understand the physiognomy of organisms now, given the, the complexity of those organisms, especially, you know, the eye is amazingly complex. It, it takes all of these other processes working in harmony, right, to achieve a kind of stasis so that, you know, the eye doesn't just spurt tears out all the time, you know, or the, so that your eye doesn't just uh, dry up or something like it takes this whole sort of homeostasis going on at once. And that really makes no sense with a sort of chaotic uh, blind process. But anyway, I didn't want to go off into all that. I'm just making the point that we start to see when we when we look into the actual philosophy and worldview of it, which I didn't for a long time. I didn't really have any set opinion on uh, evolution per se until about the last five years. And I started digging more and more and more into it. And the more I dug into it, the more uh, skeptical I became. And then as a result, uh, I started noticing that, you know, nobody else really, you know, you have some people who will talk about uh, social Darwinism and that, that is the uh, rule of philosophy of the ruling elite. And that blends very well, of course, with transhumanism and Luciferianism. Uh, but, uh, you know, nobody really goes after the evolutionary presuppositions, but I do. When I was first watching your talks on YouTube, when you mentioned you were Christian Orthodox, it kind of threw me for a loop. And but it was interesting because mm -hmm. I think there's purpose. I, I don't think everything's random. Mm -hmm. So I liked hearing you talk about it and in, in the argument with JF, I understood like 1% of it, you know, I'm like a philosophy idiot, but I, I thought what you were saying was making more and more sense. Like when I would listen to it over and over again. So like the mm -hmm. universe has telos and purpose right. and making universal truth claims mm -hmm. uh, presupposes logic or intelligence. Correct. Was that? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the basic argument there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that tying into Aristotle. And then the West being kind of infiltrated with Platonism, is that correct? From the Orthodox vantage point, uh, Aristotle and Plato are both problematic, uh, but they're also insightful. So I've tried to to strike a balance for a long time. And, you know, humans are, nat are creatures of extremes, so we tend to adopt a thing and go full bore with it without, you know, thinking in terms of balance. <laughs> so 
Uh, orthodoxy is neither Aristotelian uh, nor Platonic, and certainly when it comes to any of the of the philosophers, what I tend to say is that they all have insights and they all have errors, and it's kind of on a continuum. So somebody like Marx might even have some insights, but he's certainly far worse of a philosopher than somebody like I don't know, maybe Heidegger or somebody, they would be certainly be better. But from the, the vantage point of Orthodox theology, we we wouldn't necessarily side with either Plato or Aristotle because the, the problems in either one of those systems from or in for ultimately from any of the Greeks or any of the Far Eastern philosophies uh, would essentially be the same. They, they would boil down to the same types of problems because systems of thought, worldviews, they can kind of be boiled down to starting points and the implications of those starting points. So if you see me in a debate, what I'm always doing is that I'm, I'm looking at my worldview its starting point and its implications. And then I'm doing the same thing with the other guy's worldview. So I'm looking at what he says and what he assumes. And then I'm looking at whether the things that he later says that match up to the things that he assumes. And a lot of times people aren't really aware of what they're assuming. So this is called presuppositional apologetics or what's known as the transcendental argument for God. So that I'm a big proponent of that. So when you see me in debates, particularly with the atheists, uh, that's what you're seeing me do is I'm, I'm basically, like you said, uh, pointing out that the worldview of the atheist, the materialist, the nihilist like JF is not like he thinks it is. The way that I prove it is by pointing out that he himself doesn't actually live according to his own presuppositions and assumptions. So he'll, on the one hand, make truth claims, and then a minute later, he will deny the possibility of truth claims. It's that simple. There's a book, you might've heard of it, but it's by Carl C. Lindegren called Cold War in Biology. And he details, I think he calls them like vitalists versus the genetic determinists and, mm -hmm. and how a normal person might think the best evidence wins the debate. But no, it's like more bureaucratic things. And a lot of the atheistic arguments, like the things that JF were saying, were very in line with uh, him eating his cantaloupe <laughs> and, and just being a genetically determined machine, which I which just my layman studying of physiology just doesn't, it doesn't really jive with that. Yeah. But I, I mean, and I'm not discounting that type of approach, but you can just, I think, easily refute that by pointing out what's called the naturalist fallacy or the determinist fallacy, which is to say that JF wants credit for writing his book. Then he's assuming and acting as if he is a rational, conscious agent who has a self, right? And in other words, if determinism is true and you're a completely determined biological being, then you haven't actually learned that determinism is true. You're just going through some determined process. And that whole idea that we're not in control and you can't really do anything to change your situation just serves the oligarchy perfectly. Oh, absolutely. And that's part of social Darwinism. You're just part of this vast machinery. And if you look out in nature, you see that uh, death is just as much a part of, quote, nature as uh, life is. Therefore, why not deify these two seemingly equal processes in nature? That's why natural law theory itself doesn't work. If I look out in nature, I see death is just as powerful a force, maybe even more powerful than life. Therefore, why not actually just serve, quote, death? I mean, that's kind of the Luciferian ideology, right? And if that's the case, then we're at the position position where Kessler and Bertrand Russell say, and Jonas Salk say, uh, that we should engineer death. Why not become the priests of death and engineer and use death to the advantage of the species, namely ourselves, right? The elite. <laughs> That's their mindset. That's what they literally say. So to be consistent with that worldview actually just leads to the, the Luciferian Gnostic type of view. And the only, the only position that critiques that is a position that critiques Darwinism and critiques so-called natural law theory and is Orthodox Christianity. To, to me, the only two, that's the only two, two options. They're either Luciferian who believes that death is just as uh, good and natural as life, and why not eat your enemies <laughs> or kill your enemies, as opposed to Orthodox Christianity, which says reality has a beginning, middle, and an end. Life has meaning. There is uh, objective right and wrong. There's objective truth and false. And, you know, there is a spiritual battle going on. Something I enjoyed about the conversation with Adam Kokesh, he was talking about the non-aggression principle or something. You're like, well, why should I accept that? Nothing. I've never really thought about questioning people making the universal truth claims. Like, I'm glad you put a name, uh, a word. Yeah, universal truth claims and ethical claims go together and they can't be disentangled. That's the point I was trying to make to ask yourself in the vegan gains debate, which he didn't want to go down that route because he knows it's right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go down there. It's orthogonal. Uh, 
No, because he knows that 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 uh, meta ethics is is assumed, right? In any kind of ethical argumentation, and meta ethical claims assume metaphysical claims, and they also assume epistemological claims. So, yeah, you can never separate these two. I think that's uh, one of the strongest points uh, in presuppositional argumentation and thought. You know, again, logically forces a person to to be more consistent. So, you know, a lot of times you'll notice people in discourse, in debate, in different ideologies, they'll make claims, but they don't really have a basis for why one should or should not do things. So, yeah, exactly. Why should I? accept the non-aggression principle, especially if I look out at nature and I see nature's got a lot of aggression going on. I mean, there's a lot of predator prey going on in the natural world. And the Luciferians have simply been more consistent in the sense that they say, yeah, exactly. Nature is a apex predator dominance hierarchy. Therefore, why not just be consistent with that and crush your enemies, rise to the top, become one with your zip drive. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Uh, I think you had said in a previous interview that you didn't think necessarily that things were finished and that life was a participatory process. And that, I, I don't know very much about it, but is that anything similar to process theology? Uh, not really. I mean, process uh, philosophy could be traced to uh, Alfred North Whitehead and Hegel. And for Orthodox Christianity, there's really, not, neither one of them are really that useful per se. I mean, again, all philosophers can be insightful. Uh, you know, Hegel has insights, but the danger is always the temptation to try to take one of those systems and then so-called Christianize it. I mean, you know, this is what Hegel did with his with his ver version of God or version of the Trinity. It's, it's really just his own philosophy using the language and garb of Christianity. Process uh, philosophy is essentially part of the, the problem of dialectics. And whether it's Hegel or Marx or Whitehead, one of the things that we see as the problem of philosophy in the West all the way back to Plato is, is dialectics. And dialectics means different things in different contexts. Sometimes dialectics just means the process of rational argumentation and engagement. And in that sense, there's nothing wrong with dialectics, right? You and I are having a dialectical exchange here. Nothing, nothing wrong with that. And then we are, in a sense, converging through this discussion through the assumption of reason and logic, ratiocination or whatever, towards hopefully attaining uh, better knowledge, better better understandings. So in that sense, Hegel was right that that process goes on. The problem with dialectics in a metaphysical sense, and that's what we reject, is the idea that there are uh, absolutized forces, you could say, within nature or within time, within history, within, within governments, within um, political movements, whatever – principles within creation that are in com uh, complete battle and tension. So dialectical tensions, and you, for example, if you looked at Far Eastern religions, that's kind of their basis, right? They look at night and day, man and fe male and female, and they recognize that there are these contraries, these oppositional forces. And what they do is they make a metaphysical leap from that. And they said, well, then it, all of reality must then be dialectical tension between competing uh, forces and the solution must be that all things have to return to a kind of ultimate unity. So, for example, in all the Far Eastern religions, there's a tendency to see the problem of uh, man's problem or whatever, the world's problem, the, the location of evil is in particularity and difference, distinctions, right? So that they quite literally identify that as man's problem. And because Plato, you know, who is, again, sort of the father of Western philosophy, because Plato uh, learned his thought from the Far East. And he talks about that in the Timaeus. He got his his uh, doctrines from Egypt. And Egypt got their doctrines from probably ancient, you know, Indo-Aryan societies or whatever. And, you know, Chinese and Far Eastern ph philosophy, they all kind of have some uh, common origin in these ideas of the absolute being this kind of impersonal beyond, right? In the Greek, it's called aparon, uh, holy other. So the, the, in other words, the, the idea became in the West that, and this is again in Plato, that all things have to get back to this this great unity because man's problem, humanity's problem, the universe's problem is that there's distinctions between things. But of course, that's not the problem. <laughs> so, so essentially, uh, and this is what makes Orthodox Christianity unique, is that it uh, is opposed to dialectics. It it rejects the ideas of uh, dialectics in nature. I mean, certainly we see oppositions in nature. Day is distinct from night, but day and night are not metaphysically at war with one another. And and, and they're not and man and male and female are not metaphysically at war with one another. We believe distinctions are fine. If God created us, then He created us 
the way we are, and there's there's nothing wrong with having distinctions. So we have a different theodicy, a different um, doctrine of where and what it, evil is, what man's problem is, and that's because we have again different uh, a different worldview and a different um, philosophical starting point for how we we do things. There's a great debate between uh, one of the perennialists, Fritoff Schuon, and he would kind of be uh, Carl Jung is kind of in the in the category of the perennialists. So he would, you know, this would kind of be a direct influence on somebody like Peterson. I don't know if Peterson's read The Perennialist, but uh, if you look at somebody like Fritoff Schuon, he had a debate with Philip Sherrard, who at the time was um, was arguing the basic orthodox principle on this. And Schuon was kind of saying, look, all the religions have this same skeletal structure, and therefore they're all just pointing to an absolute that we can't encompass or name. And, and then it's impersonal. And once we personalize God or the absolute— what happens is is that we cut him off or it off uh, from its manifestation in all the other religions, right? So in other words, if you say that one religion is true and it's the, you know, God-chosen embodiment within history, then you have delineated and limited this deity. In other words, the assumption on the part of somebody like Shuan was that there's a dialectic between the possibility of uh, God having anything to do with time and space and God considered in himself, right? So this is the same problem, again, of all the Eastern religions. The Far Eastern religions all have the same assumption of ultimate reality being impersonal, just being some some generic force. And what Sherard argued in contrast to that was that that is self-refuting. So essentially he gave a transcendental argument against Shuan and argued that if all of the world religions were all the same and, and they're all just kind of window dressing for this this absolute impersonal force, you couldn't know that. It would be impossible for you to come to that conclusion because you came to these conclusions from within time and space, which are all illusory, you see. Uh, all the distinctions within time and space are illusory. You are illusory. Your thoughts are illusory. So it boils down into foolishness. And that's why, again, the transcendental argument is so powerful is that it's useful not just for the atheist, but also for the pseudo-religious perennialist or syncretist who thinks that, you know, the kind of new age view, all the religions are just simply uh, window dressing for the same so-called truth. But again, it's not really a truth if, if it requires you coming to learn it within time and space. And so ultimately, it's self-refuting in the exact same way as the uh, claims of JF were self-refuting in our debate. Does dialectics relate to relativism, which relates to oligarchy and like things like the what you turned me on to, the Jaffe Berylson memo and, and things like that, just like the total chaotic destruction of the culture sure, in the sure. West? Sure, I mean, I mean, we're, what we're witnessing in the West is the result of a long ideological train of thought. And I don't mean to make it purely ideological. Obviously, there were powerful banking families and forces involved in the promotion of, of a lot of ideas. Uh, but just considered from the vantage point of ideo ideological succession, you have, you know, from Plato, the introduction of dialectical philosophy in its metaphysical sense, which is continued into Aristotle, continued into uh, their students, the uh, Middle Platonists, the Neoplatonists. This is encountered and battled with by the church fathers in the first uh, thousand years of the church. You have eight consecutive ecumenical councils from Nicaea in 325 all the way up to the last ecumenical council in the ninth century in the sense of a, a unified uh, Western and Eastern church before the split of uh, Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. But prior to that, you have this uh, unified battle with, with uh, dialectics and Hellenism. And in fact, the church fathers in those councils actually make this very clear. Many times over, they talk about battling the, the dialecticians and the dialectical philosophy of people like Origen or Celsus or uh, Arius or Nestorius or, or any of the early heretics. They're all sort of coming with these philosophical presuppositions. So following through up into the Middle Ages, uh, what you get in the West is the rise, of course, of the papacy and the adoption of a lot of different philosophical presuppositions in medieval scholasticism that give birth to the uh, Reformation, the Enlightenment, the scientific revolution. And you can very clearly trace this ideological trek from point A to point B to point C to point D. I mean, it's, it really does follow in kind of a domino succession from one ideology to the next. And, and what you get is essentially the uh, the insertion of uh, dialectics into the, the totality of Western thought. Now, that's not to say that, you know, ancient societies or any societies have been perfectly free from the problem of dialectics. I mean, in our view, dialectics entered when 
the fall happened when uh, when Adam and Eve transgressed, they entered into this state where they were prone to setting up dialectical tensions. Right. Anyway, so this leads to in the modern world, uh, the rise of the technocracy, which has perfected, I guess you could say, the technique of manipulating dialectics in the sociological sphere. So this is a little different from what I was talking about was more, you know, philosophic and, and metaphysical the, and, and ontological. This is more so in what you're talking about. It's the same kind of principles. And of course, metaphysics and ontology, it certainly reflects into and impacts the sociological sphere. But yes, there is a, a technique that if people who have studied Hegel, yeah, you you would know how to set groups off against one another. And you don't even have to understand Hegel. I mean, you know, Caesar understood this a long time ago when he wrote the Gallican Wars. He talked about how he could rile one tribe up against another tribe. I mean, this is just kind of basic trickery. So it doesn't require knowledge of like the mysteries <laughs> of, you know, Plato or, uh, you know, Hegel's unreadable treatises. Uh, you know, it's just if you know basic con man tactics, you, you could pull <laughs> off some of that stuff. But the, the global elite do it uh, at, at a bigger scale than the local con man does. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I, I It's definitely a lot to take in, but I, I think you do a really great job breaking it down. Uh, one thing I did want to touch on, and you do break it down very well, is uh, the depopulation strategy and some of the schemes that they have, basically, that were uh, documented in the Jaffe Berylson memo that you turned me on to. But things like uh, restructuring of the family, postpone or avoid marriage, alter the image of ideal family size, compulsory education of children, encourage increased homosexuality, educate for family limitation, fertility control agents in the water supply, uh, encourage women to work. But um, yeah, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, if you understand that, you understand the overall game plan. I mean, that's kind of the essence of it. You know, I mentioned earlier when we started the talk, I was talking about the rough outline of the things that all the globalists agree on. And you can go back 100 years ago all the way up to now. And there are a few basics that, that nobody disagrees on. So if you're going to be in the club of, of the you know 6,000 managerial class that, that run the planet, these are the kind of basics that you can't uh, disagree on. And one of those is depopulation. The other one is Darwinism. The other one is a unified uh, economic plan for the globe and technocracy. Right. So all those things are the kind of the creed, you could say, of, of the globalists. You, if you wrote a globalist creed, you could – you could come up with uh, four or five things that every one of them agrees on. Now, they might disagree on the, the best tactics to get to that end, end goal or what to do in Syria or what to do in this place or that place. But typically, uh, in the big picture scheme, there's there's no disagreements. You might have globalists who prefer capitalism and you might have globalists that prefer outright uh, socialism and communism. But either way, it doesn't matter because they are both uh, global in their perspective and they're uh, both based on – uh, atheism and materialism, both socialism and capitalism are materialistic presuppositions. And that's another thing that, that I focus on a lot that a lot of people don't. A lot of people choose, oh, I'm going to be a libertarian and anarcho whatever capitalist. Uh, oh, no, I'm going to side with this, uh, you know, this sort of collective socialism or whatever. Oh, I'm going to be a third position fascist or whatever. Uh, I, I don't take any of those systems because uh, I think that the last 300 years demonstrates that all the uh, the systems of the 20th century were essentially the result of consecutive revolutions. And those, those consecutive revolutions were verifiably started by Freemasons and uh, people in secret societies who wanted to enact a, a revolutionary, pro revolutionary program for the entire world. Um, so anyway – Yes. If you understand the basics uh, uh, of where we're going, that's it's not that difficult. You want a unified monetary system, a unified technocratic AI structure to basically run everything on its own and transhumanism and depopulation. That's that's the whole that's everything. And just some of the people that you've mentioned in your lectures, Walter Lippmann, uh, Jonas Salk, uh, John Holdren, Big New Brzezinski. And the crazy part is they're telling you the plan like in their books, but it never penetrates the public consciousness of what's going on. One of the reasons that it doesn't project into the public consciousness is, well, there's multiple reasons, but, you know, toxic diet, toxic chemicals, toxic mm -hmm, culture. Mm -hmm. That's all a big part of it. The education system is brainwashing. Certainly that's all part of it. Media lies. Uh, but people have also been kept from learning basic critical thinking. They've intentionally not been taught that in school because if you learn crit basic critical thinking, you can suss out, you know, truthhoods from falsehoods and contradictions. So that's very important. And 
instead people are basically buy into the identification of some team, you know, Democrat, Republican or whatever. Uh, and that's that's how they're controlled. Uh, and, and so people don't have the nuance that's necessary to make proper distinctions. And in fact, this is you see the same problems in what I was saying earlier about the religious sphere, people who have the Far Eastern kinds of thoughts, they want to bl- they want to blend everything down into an ultimate unity. And those Far Eastern worldviews, that's exactly what Huxley said would be the religion of the New World Order. In perennial philosophy, he says, yeah, everybody will be absorbed into a giant blob. And that's why we find the Far Eastern philosophy is much more useful for the promotion of collectivism. Now, when I say that, that doesn't mean that anarcho-individualism is the answer. It's not, because mm-hmm. again, the dialectical tension uh, that you're talking about also applies to the socio-political sphere in the sense of neither promoting and preferring the individual over against the collective or the collective over against the individual. That's another one in a many dialectic that can be enacted. And that's why we see this, the same people who, who run world socialism just happen to be funded by the same people that run the libertarian free market stuff. Speaking of libertarianism, you're conversation with Adam Kokesh. I thought you made his point untenable within the first 10 minutes of the debate. <laughs> like the um, Right, I think most yeah, most people would agree. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, your conversations with Mark Hackard are great. Mm. He's equally stimulating in his point of yeah, Mark's view. Mark's a super, super smart guy, a brilliant uh, Russia geopolitical analyst. I think it's so fascinating that the first whiff of the Russiagate thing that, uh, not that I'm extremely percep- perceptive or anything, but I was like, this sounds phony. And mm-hmm. uh, this is like an acceptable conspiracy theory that people have ran with. Mm-hmm. And I think it's so mm-hmm. it's propagated by the media endlessly, obviously. And the other thing that kind of ignited my thought on this is on, uh, I was coming back from Japan and bored out of my mind and I watched Red Sparrow. I did a stream on that. It was pretty funny. <laughs> I usually just watch movies and I'm not actually, I'm not very perceptive. I don't think about the themes that are being presented to me while I'm watching the mm. film. I could not even believe how thick it was being laid on. Like the CIA yeah. was the good people yeah. and the Russians were the evil, horrible people. And I was yeah, like, yeah, the CIA handler is going <laughs> to save you, save her from her, her Russian gangsters who were, yeah. I don't know, just your general thought from talking to Mark or your own points of view about, I don't know, B- Big New Brzezinski, didn't he think China and Russia were the last two empires that had to be toppled or something similar? Yeah, I mean, in Grand Chess Board, he says the key to controlling the world is controlling the Eurasian heartland, and particularly Afghanistan, of course, is the gateway to the Eurasian heartland. So that's the Mackinder theory of geopolitical analysis. And that's been adopted, of course, by the U.S. Uh, Imperium from the British Empire. So that's certainly still the game plan. That's the basics of geopolitics there. And that was the purpose of 1979 and Afghanistan and all that. That's not to say that the Soviets were a genuine godly force fighting the, the West. Both these systems are atheistic at root, whether it's Western capitalism or, or Eastern uh, socialism. But at, a, a, at the same time, you know, there really are wars. There really are battles. There really are spies who, you know, spy on one another. So the games are played out at different levels. And certainly at the top, if you listen to the really good interview that Mark and I did about uh, Victor Rothschild, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. he's, he's a great example of somebody who was playing both sides. He was playing both the KGB and the British intelligence side of things. And that was a big vindication for what a lot of people had suspected for a long time. <clears throat> and if you read Professor Anthony Sutton, you know, you get the same idea with uh, Wall Street uh, funding Bolsheviks and helping to build up the Soviet empire and all this. So that's all true. And then, you know, sometimes rulers don't always do what the West likes and they get toppled. I'm not an expert on, you know, Russian history or Soviet history. Mark certainly knows more about all that than I do. But there is an interesting case to be made for Stalin doing some things that the Atlantis didn't like. And, you know, we've seen people who even were puppets installed by the CIA, like Saddam, you know, they eventually get, they expire like milk and they get removed. (laughs) Uh, you know, that's one of the reasons I read uh, Miles Copeland, who was a famous uh, CIA operative. I read his book, uh, Game of Nations, that's part of the Global's book series. And he describes this, too. He, he talks about the period of time where they worked with Nasser for the purpose of game theory. They let Nasser do his stuff uh, and they wanted to eventually update and revolutionize Egypt. And Copeland says in that book that the whole purpose of all that with Egypt was to bring Egypt into the modern world so that it could be globalized, so that it could be depopulated. But it took several decades and phases of this. And they had it actually worried out uh, how to do this over many decades. Now, people like Nasser and people like, you know, that run the governments, 
they're not always hip to all this. <laughs> they don't know what's going on. Uh, and a lot of times these installed leaders are corrupted and compromised and they're in it for themselves. Now, I, I'm not saying that, that that means that every person who opposes the West is completely corrupt and compromised. I'm just saying that that's the reality of the real world. So I don't put any hope in any sort of political leader. I think that Putin's kind of like Trump. He does some good things and some bad things, but I don't I don't have any any hope or trust in Putin as an individual to save civilization or something like this, or that Trump's going to save us from this or that. I mean, the, the problems of Russia are pretty severe when it comes to Western globalist uh, entities in Russia, you know, like the um, uh, Carnegie Foundation or any of the Fortune 100. I mean, they're all in Russia, too. So, so I'm very aware of all that. But at the same time, you know, Russia has built uh, thousands of churches in the last few years. I mean, what Brzezinski talks about with destabilization, what he called the arc of crisis throughout the Eastern Bloc, there's no doubt that uh, the, the last few years since the Cold War have been about making sure that there's not going to be any deviation on the part of Russia from the globalist game plan. And all that's very real. I mean, all the stuff that we've seen in the Ukraine, that's all real. Um, what's going on in Syria, that's all very real. I don't think that China represents a uh, real opposition to globalism. I think they're very much part of that structure. But there may be elements within China that could be seen as a potential concern. The, the way the globalists do this is that they'll look at these places and these areas and these countries, and it's not so much about the stuff that's happening now. They'll look at and project what could be the case 10, 20 years from now. So they're interested in making sure that 10, 20 years from now, there is isn't any movement or ideology or the thought process or church or anything like that that could, you know, down the road cause deviation. In other words, We've seen like in the last week, the apparent uh, challenge of Soros to China, China versus Soros, Soros versus China. Again, that, that probably has more to do with Soros money interests and plans for the future and who's going to be, you know, the top dogs in the, in the coming technocratic global system than it does anything to do with like, oh, China is going to beat the new world order or something like that. And that's, that's nonsense. Your bread and butter is the predictive programming of movies and television. You just do a f fantastic job going through these things. And with Thanks. Jay Widener, the Hollywood Decoded series, I got through mm -hmm. most of the episodes and, and thought they were excellent. And Oh, great. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. It was uh, probably one of the crowning achievements of my life to date. So thank you. And you did another Michael Caine, which was great. <laughs> Now that, 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 now, the thing with Jay Widener is, he's a bloody fool, and I wouldn't trust him as far as I throw him. Now, when I went, I, I'm joking, he, he's a great guy. I'm just kidding. But now, when I started talking like Michael Caine on the set, people started going crazy, and they thought he lost his mind. <laughs> No, they, they, they really weren't expecting that. And uh, my thought was to be a little more wacky. And, <laughs> you know, when you have like a, a actual producer and people that are we, we had a two time Emmy winning producer actually for the show. And the setup was very, it was, you know, it was very serious, very professional. And, you know, I wanted to be a little more a little more goofy, but I think it came out good. I'm, I'm very pleased with what came out. I wish that we had had a season two. I think it was a little edgy. I don't think Guy really wanted to promote it too much. It was so, you know, it's kind of too dark and too cerebral for the Gaia audience. But I, you know, I, I think it's phenomenal. I think it's, um, I'm not just bragging or I'm trying to be self-righteous, but uh, I'm really happy. With it. it came out way better than I expected, not because of Jay or anybody that worked on it. It's just that I'd seen other Gaia TV shows and I was kind of iffy on it, not knocking Gaia. Uh, it actually wasn't Gaia. It was actually Jay's company that produced the show. And then all Gaia did was just air it. They just streamed it. So they really didn't have a whole lot to do with it other than that we filmed it at one of their studios. So... But thank you. Yeah, it's it's predictive programming. It's I don't even remember how the list came up of I think I just wrote down like, you know, 23 movies that I thought would be uh, worth analyzing. And I spent like a month writing a whole season two, which will never be <laughs> unless somebody else picks it up. But I mean, there, there's a whole season two that's that's written like 150 pages or so. But uh, oh well, that's what happens. But by the way, we did. Uh, we are. Um, there is a new show. Uh, not affiliated with Gaia, a uh, different type of show that we filmed a sizzle reel for in LA. And, and hopefully that will come to fruition. But uh, I don't know, given the saturation of shows, streaming shows, there's so many shows out there that, uh, I mean, I, th I have no doubt that the show would be good. I had no doubt that Hollywood Dakota would be good. But the way it is with that kind of entertainment type stuff is that it, it's, it's just having a good idea is not enough. Like you got to have advertising, marketing and all that behind you. And you've got to have 
the right kind of network picking it up. So there's a whole, you know, list of factors that go into also maybe you've got the best talent, you've got the best idea, you've got a great production, but you've also got to have these other engines behind you. I was in a band signed to Island and we had our A&R guy got fired. And mm. that's when we all realized we were screwed <laughs> yeah. because like, nobody, you know what I mean. yeah. yeah, nobody at the label, uh, we were like a new act. Nobody cared about us. And so exactly mm. to what you're talking about, you need many levels of people being your cheerleader and, and bringing things to fruition to like make it in those types of industries. Right. I, I think it's, it's such a simple breakdown, but I, I guess eyes wide shut of predictive programming. And you pointed out like GI Joe, and even, uh, mm. I think you mentioned in one of the interviews, Josie and the Pussycats, people mm-hmm. being subconsciously or consciously trained to think about things in a certain way. I think that's really interesting and obviously is a through line to all the work you do. Well, it came about, yeah, as a result of uh, what I was studying in grad school. One of the things about grad school is that you get a little more freedom to choose the topics that you want to study and write on. And when I was going to do my master's thesis, I wanted to do something pop culture related because I I used to, I had an old blog a long time ago and I posted a lot of conspiracy stuff and it got a decent audience. It got a decent amount of traction. Uh, I decided I wanted to change it up. I didn't really like the direction it was going in. And I was having some ideological shifts as well around 2008, seven, eight, somewhere in there. I was kind of getting a little dissatisfied with the Ron Paul libertarian type of worldview. I was uh, moving more in the traditional type of perspective that I have now today. So I didn't want to keep going in that direction with my old blog, but I was also at the same time starting to post movie analysis type stuff about seven, 2007, 2008, because I was noticing, oh, there are actually, you know, conspiracy elements in movies. And I'd read a few books by some authors that had touched on this subject and read some, uh, some analyses along these lines. So I just started blogging about it on a new blog that was going to be more so focused on movie stuff. And that ended up, yeah, like you said, kind of becoming the bread and butter. And at the same time, 2011, 12, I was, I had chosen 007 as master thesis. So ended up having a falling out with the advisor and and uh, I didn't finish the master thesis. I think it got about one third done, but uh, the, the idea stuck. And I thought, well, you know what, what's the point even of doing the master thesis? Why not just write a book about this stuff? So I had it in my mind that there would eventually maybe be a book, but I just kind of kept chugging along and, and churning out articles. I wrote hundreds and hundreds of articles over that, that time span. Eventually what happened was I think I, I met Mark reached out to me and we started chatting. I think at that time he was writing for Tacky's Mag and and, then, and I met Patrick, I think, because Mark had or Patrick had Mark on. And then that's how I met Patrick. So I started going on uh, 21 Wire with Patrick. And Patrick knew, uh, you know, Sean Stone. And he knew uh, Corbett. I think they had done an interview at one time. And then kind of through that means I got uh, connected with a lot of people like Syrian Girl and and uh, I did an interview with Corbett as well. Uh, maybe we did two, two or three. I can't remember. But yeah, just kind of, you know, you, you, you start meeting people and you start doing interviews and, and people start uh, catching on. And then what ended up helping me a lot was, was Buzzsaw uh, with Sean Stone. And that's how I think Jay Widener saw that. And I think my publisher saw the the Buzzstone or was she the Buzzstone? <laughs> <laughs> Sean Buzzstone. Uh, my publisher saw, saw the Sean Stone interview because he had just gotten Sean to do a book. And then he emailed me and said, do you have a book? And I said, well, yeah, but I didn't, I had, you know, just all these movie analyses. So I was like, I'll just stick all the movie analyses into into (laughs) it. And it worked, right. It worked out really good. I think Jay Widener reached out to me after that. And he said, Hey, you know, are you going to be at this? uh, I got, I had gotten invited to speak at an event in 2015 in Texas, the secret space program. And my lecture was on predictive programming and film and and science fiction and stuff. So I got to meet quite a few people through that. And yeah, it just kind of snowballed, like it snowballed into, you know, meeting this person, this person, this person, and people reaching out, just sending emails, basically. That led to the book, and then that led to the TV show. And now there is the second book, and I'm very proud of that one. I think it's actually a better written book. Um, you know, your first book's, you know, kind of your a crowning achievement. You're very proud of that. But I think the second one is a better written book. It's funnier. It's uh, better uh, prose, better better writing, and it's longer. So it actually covers more stuff. But uh, but yeah, so I started in the first one, like you said, with, for those that aren't familiar, it's basically 363 pages, 404 footnotes about big directors. So I, I took on Kubrick in the first 100 pages, 
uh, Eyes Wide Shut, Shining. And then I took on H.G. Uh, Wells and Spielberg in the next section. I was talked about AI and I talked about E.T. And then I took on Hitchcock and 007 in the next section and David Lynch. And then the last section was kind of a just CIA and Hollywood overall chapter. You said something in one of the interviews, directors have directors. And I thought that was a good way of explaining it. Can you maybe encapsulate the connection of the, the CIA and Hollywood? Well, there's a whole lot of layers and levels to this as well. So, you know, it's not like everything is completely controlled. But yeah, I mean, there's there's a liaison offices between, you know, the intelligence agencies and different studios in Hollywood. And that's kind of well known now. It's been going on for a long time. And then, you know, a lot of famous actors have been spies. So that's another layer and level to this uh, in the history of cinema and theater as well. You know, you can go all the way back to the Elizabethan era and you had actors and actresses who were, or I get actors, I don't think you had actors actresses yet, but they were spies. So this has gone on for a long time. And um, I think, yeah, a lot of people aren't aware of that if you haven't kind of studied those specific topics in college, you know, in university. Uh, I did. So it was more and more obvious to me that that was the case. And I just decided, well, that makes for such an, an, uh, an interesting topic that not many people have written on. You know, there's a handful of books that are on this. And two or three of them are written mainly for academics. They're not really written for mass reading, mass consumption. So one of the challenges in my book was to try to maintain both a reader, an easy readable type of book, that, but that was also academic. It was also goofy and fun at the same time. So it's a weird mix. There's not really, it's not any, any book like it really. I'm not, I'm, I'm not bragging. I'm just, I think I'm stating a fact because most books conform to a specific set genre. They're either academic or they're pop or they're whatever. This is not any of those. It's, it's a very unique, weird cultural commentary, I guess, is the best way to put it, what it is. Frances Stoner Saunders, in one of her talks, she says the CIA is treating the culture as like a bonsai tree or something, and they're supporting branches they want to grow. Is that something like Hollywood? Scripts that serve the oligarchy will be made, and ones that don't will be made less often or not at all? Sure. Scripts can be changed to put certain narratives and plot lines in or, or cultural messages or propaganda messages or, yeah, I mean, this, there's a lot of different interests that could be involved. It could be the CIA. It could be corporate interest in a certain film or, uh, you know, a lot of different things. The, the Fortune 100 and the big banks and the CIA and Hollywood, they're pretty well intertwined. You know, I mean, there's, there's not a big in the Pentagon. There's not a big distinction. But because this revolving door, a lot of the people who will go from one will go to the other. Right. You know, Angelina Jolie goes from Hollywood to the CFR. You know, there's no better example than that. And didn't Ben Affleck say that Hollywood was filled with CIA agents? Sure. Yeah, he's probably one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. And again, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Maybe it was an interview on Red Ice, which all the ones I've seen were pretty awesome. But you guys talked about mass trauma and just the news and, and just so many elements of culture just being this just snowball of trauma. Well, there was a lot of studies done of trauma, you know, by Tavistock and by the CIA and by military intelligence over the last century. And they pretty well perfected the technique of how to traumatize people, I would say. And even things like Hitchcock films were studied on the basis of how they might traumatize the audience. I think there were studies done on Psycho in that regard. I think that's in my first book. But they know that cinema has the ability to do that. In fact, in my new book, my second book, I talked about how that was shown in Clockwork Orange, if you remember the scenes where they, they essentially traumatize Alex to put him in a catatonic state. And that's really what uh, behavioral operant conditioning, uh, behavioral modification, Skinner, Pavlov, that's all about. So that pops up in a lot of films. And I talk about how films have shown us that very thing. And that's what mass media and mass uh, ritual trauma, things like, you know, big events. I won't name them, but <laughs> big <laughs> events. That's what uh, they are designed to do, right? I'm, to, I'm trying to avoid the, <laughs> the algorithm God, right? Um, that's what they're designed to do is essentially cause that kind of uh, dis dissociative, uh, catatonic, apathetic uh, state in the population to make them more suggestible, more manageable. You know, it, it's all once you kind of key into it, but it, it kind of makes sense. Oh, so, well, yeah, well, of course, that's what they want to do. Right. And just to leave on a positive note, you, you mentioned a few times that you don't see it going their way. And, and one of the ways to tear the agenda down is basically to make fun of it, which is what you do pretty well. Well, thanks. Yeah, I, I've always been somewhat goofy and comedic and 
initially I wanted to be a comedian before I realized that you have to kind of be in the system's cult to get anywhere in entertainment, right? So, but I never would have dreamed there would be a way, you know, to basically wear all the hats at once, which is, I guess, the blessing that we have with the internet right now is that I can kind of be the whole person of me that I am, not just the guy interested in theology and philosophy or not just the guy into geopolitics or not just the guy into you know, movies and also being ridiculous and doing impressions and, and acting like an idiot. I could do all those things at once. I could be an idiot, <laughs> idiot theologian, <laughs> uh, analyst all at once. Cool, man. I mean, we talked about it, but jaysanalysis.com, where we can find you, your Twitter, Esoteric Hollywood, Hollywood Decoded, your books, what's the best way to buy them, etc. Yeah, please buy them at the shop at my website. I offer signed copies. It's a little bit more than Amazon, but, uh, you know, Amazon's not the best for authors. So if you go to jaysanalysis.com, you'll see the shop link there. And then uh, you can also subscribe to my site where you get access to talks, lectures, like the full talks. Uh, most of the time I do half free, half subscription. And uh, there's entire courses, entire lectures on Plato's Republic on Tragedy and Hope, uh, Globus books that we've been talking about. There's dozens of interviews and it's a pretty big archive, about th I think three years worth of an archive now of, of stuff there that's mainly, a, you know, kind of a learning tool is what it really functions as. I also do tutoring. I tutor people uh, if they want to sign up for tutoring. I do that about once a week with different people in different topics philosophy, geopolitics, whatever. There is, yeah, the TV show is, so there's links at the website to the TV show at Gaia. I don't, I don't own that or control that. So that's, that's a separate thing from me. But if people want to watch the show, they're more than, I would encourage that if they want to subscribe to Gaia to do that. And then the book, yeah, to Esther Hollywood one and two at my site and subscription. And that's all I can think of. And then there's links at the website too. My YouTube channel, it's, it's grown quite a bit the last year. So, you know, be sure and subscribe on as many of the outlets as you can, because of course, you know, we, ne we never know when the outlets might go away. Just some of your favorite debates, like the JF debate, the Robert Taylor debate. I've gotten a lot out of those. Can, is there any other ones you think that are specifically good? I kind of view them all the same because I feel like I'm always debating the same, <laughs> <laughs> the same position. It's always the same opponent with some variation on the same argument. So it's like, I guess the Robert Taylor debate. One of them was atheism. Actually, two of them, I guess, were. And then um, the one was economics. So did you see the Robert Taylor economics? That one's pretty funny. I, th I saw one where you guys just had a conversation and he was under the impression it wasn't a debate. And then I saw another one where it was more of a debate and he was more antagonistic. Well, we've had three debates. So we had one on atheism and then mm -hmm. the next one was... Worski Live mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Athe Atheism. Mm -hmm. And then the next one was whether uh, capitalism had connections to Freemasonry and was materialistic. And that was on the, the Chad cast. So we've had three official debates and um, they've all been fun. I mean, <clears throat> every debate I've had has been a blast. I can't think of anyone that I didn't didn't enjoy. Uh, and they all kind of have their own, you know, unique peculiarities. You know, the, the Jim Goad one was kind of in tongue in cheek. It wasn't a real debate. Um, but probably, I, I think probably the best one is, is probably the JF debate. I mean, that's definitely the one that everybody, you know, remembers. Everybody mentions it to me. It's kind of the perennial debate. I, I doubt that, you know, unless I grow to be to some big enough level that I could debate somebody like Stefan Molyneux, I don't think there's going to be any, <laughs> there's not going to be any debate anytime soon that will be remembered like the, the JF debate. Just out of curiosity, where would have that vegan debate have gone if you had got past that stumbling block in the same spot as all the other debates <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm not anti-animal i think animal products are great but yeah. if somebody were to ask me i'd be like well i don't know how a person can be healthy if they don't incorporate some level of animal products but because i'm just well i think this is an interesting point though about because it ties into a lot of what i've been arguing the last year is the rise of this vegan issue because it's a tough one for the people in the libertarian anarcho crowd because they base their their ideology on so-called natural law theory and guess what so do all the vegans because <laughs> they're trying to be more consistent with the non-aggression principle and say well if, if nap is true from quote nature then we shouldn't eat animals oh wait a minute but in nature animals eat animals there's dominance hierarchies everywhere apex predators blah 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 that's how we evolved so there's no clear way to adjudicate between the vegan or the carnivore or the cannibal position for, for all that for that matter <laughs> and you say oh but but what about uh, which one's more healthy well what does that mean exactly to be more healthy maybe there's no reason that I should accept what is more healthy for me maybe it's ideal for me to have the 
uh, this is, this gets into the problems, for example, of utilitarianism. For example, I might say, oh, well, I want to actually just enjoy a year of eating all of my enemies and, and at the end of that year stand on a pile of a pyramid of skulls and, you know, maybe I'll go out in a blaze of glory. I'll, you know, be on top of an Aztec pyramid and I'll, uh, you know, uh, open up a grenade or something and... and Maybe, but see, this is the problem with utilitarianism is that maybe the degree of joy that I get from that year of doing that, maybe that is greater than the degree of pleasure that I would get from a year of living a healthy carnivore or vegan lifestyle. You see what I'm saying? There's Mm -hmm. there's no way to judge which of those options. This is a classic critique of of utilitarianism, which, by the way, most libertarian and classical economic theory is intimately tied up with Bentham and libertarianism, uh, or utilitarianism, excuse me. There's no, this completely destroys that view because you have no way to know whether it's quantitative or qualitative, quote, pleasure or wellness or whatever terms you want to use. There's no way to know which one is better or that you should choose. If I have a society where people are afraid that there's a serial killer running loose and I decide as the magistrate or as the, let's say we're a libertarian society and I am the head of the collective private security force that we've all (laughs) voluntarily accepted. And I decide with my friends that it's best for society to pick an innocent person to put him on trial and get rid of him so that the collective society sphere of the serial killer is allayed. How do I know which one is the better choice here? Because on the one hand, maybe it's better to soothe the fears of everybody that Jeffrey Dahmer's running around and let one guy go, or is it better to protect that one guy and let the whole society maybe fall apart from, you know, mass panic due to (laughs) serial killers. You see what I'm saying? Like this is a classic problem in utilitarianism. And when you realize that utilitarianism got so absurd that it reached the point where its philosophers were literally trying to come up with a calculus, a moral calculus to find out through mathematical principles what the appropriate pleasure numbers are and pleasure principles. I'm not joking. That's how absurd that got. You see that this completely falls apart. Why? Because it's all based on the exact same presuppositions of atheism and materialism as all of its opponents are. They all collapse into the opposite of one another and they all fall apart. But you would approach it from a biblical standpoint. There's no other way. Yeah. I mean, if you could make an argument outside of the biblical perspective, I mean, I'm not saying that it wouldn't be practically useful, but ultimately the, the problem is that the questions immediately fall back on ultimate presuppositions and ultimate faith commitments. So there's no way to avoid it. Because we're immediately talking about ethics and what's right and how we know and view the external world and the natural world. So in my worldview, there's nothing wrong with eating animals because God has allowed that given the fall. In my worldview, you can't properly interpret the world unless you understand the fall. So I just did a talk, for example, on uh, some Darwinian theories and ideologies. And one of the reasons that Darwinism became so prominent in the Victorian period was because the theologians of the Victorian period, the Church of England particularly, had given up the idea that creation was a revealed doctrine. And so in other words, when they tried to interpret the the, the natural world, they said, well, this is made by a monster because this world has uh, predators and prey. How could that be a good God? This world has mutants and it has, you know, guys that are born with, you know, male parts and female parts and, you know, babies die. And all. You know, this is a this is not the work of a benevolent creator, but of some kind of Gnostic demiurge or something. So uh, you, you can actually find quotes in Darwin where it literally sounds like the Gnostics. So point being is that it, from our vantage point, you can't actually accurately interpret the natural world unless you believe in the fall, because the fall is why the world is how it is in our in our world, in our theology. So in other words, yes, eating animals is fine because that's what's happened as a result of the fall and the way God has set up things after the fall. You see what I'm saying? Now, I'm not saying that proves my position. I'm just saying that that shows that I can't interpret the world properly. It's just consistently from my worldview, from my vantage point, without taking those things into account. Otherwise, it won't make any sense. So in other words, yes, I have to immediately Immediately, to be consistent with my view, I have to immediately fall back on how my ultimate faith commitments, namely revelation and scripture, how it interprets the, the natural world. But you can source back to a biblical perspective, but there's no way to further that argument and, and say, well, you know, uh, protein is ne- needed by the liver to store glucose to protect from cortisol. Oh, no, no. That's what I, that's what I was trying to say a minute ago when I, when I was saying that one could make it just a, a health-based argument. That's fine. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, okay. No. 
know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that you can't do that. What I'm saying is that eventually what happens in the discourse or debate with somebody who's say a vegan is that they'll start getting to the point where you, you'll get to the point where you're asking the question of, well, how do you even know what right and wrong is? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. And at that point is when it starts to diverge on the kind of presuppositional, you know, God's existence questions. I'm not, I'm not at all saying that you can't do what you're talking about. I mean, in a ways that's analogous to doing evidence-based apologetics. It wouldn't be wrong for me to say to an atheist, look uh, at the structure of an earthworm. It shows that it's been designed. But I'm not going to make that argument to an atheist without putting it in context of saying that there's no such thing as a notion of design that operates autonomously apart from my theology holistically. I don't know, does that make sense or is that a little obtuse? With all your stuff, it's like my favorite records and I, I need to take a few spins with it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I mean, that's I, that's why you were appealing because uh, you were saying some things that were resonating and other things that I were new to me or that I had never heard. I listened to an interview with Vox Day last night, and mm-hmm. the interviewer was uh, said he could tell by like a person's how they spoke if they were actually interested in finding out what was true. Mm-hmm. And again, maybe I'm getting out there, but that's kind of how you came off as somebody who's actually interested in figuring out what's true, and that's what made you appealing. Well, thanks. Yeah, most most people who you know put their time and effort in all this stuff don't do it because I mean you know it would be kind of insane to to. <laughs> put all your time and effort into this <laughs> if you weren't interested in what was true. I mean, if you just wanted to, you know, like make money or something, like there'd be plenty of other ways to go about doing it. You, you, number one, you wouldn't be questioning Darwin to make money. You have been so generous with your time. Is there anything like we glossed over that you did want to touch on before I pull the plug? Uh, no, I think that's everything. Dude, Jay, thank you so much. Thank you for all of your content, which is vast. Thank you and extremely helpful and you're just uh, funny and a good teacher and so i sincerely appreciate it and thank you for well, thanks, taking, taking the time thank you and i, I appreciate uh, having me on and, and, uh, and doing the show and uh, look forward to talking again that'd be amazing total pleasure and i'll talk to you soon all right man stay in touch god bless bye jay That's going to conclude this week's episode. I'd like to thank Jay again for talking with me and making me laugh so hard during the whole episode, basically. I think I was like crying a few times just editing the episode, so I sincerely appreciate him taking the time to talk with me and really spoon-feed the different concepts to me, which uh, a lot of them were new, so I sincerely appreciate Jay for that. Thank you guys so much for listening. Please hit the like button if you're on YouTube. Go over to Jay's channel, subscribe to that because he has a bunch of great content. And go purchase his books, which I have both of them, and and they're fantastic. So I use him as a really great resource for all things CIA uh, philosophy-related. So again, all thanks to Jay. Thank you guys for listening. Sincerely appreciate it. Take care, guys.